Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins and welcome to Life, Death and the Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium and here we explore life, death, consciousness and what it all means. Today I have Jesse Kanzer. Is that right? Did I get it right? Okay. Um, On the show, Jesse was born in the Soviet Union, a descendant of Holocaust survivors living in a communal apartment with four households, one toilet, and a rickety old bathtub in the middle of the kitchen. Her family sought asylum in the U.S., and after awaiting their fate in Austria and Italy, they finally made it to Brooklyn in 1989. As an eight-year-old refugee who spoke only Russian, Jesse yearned to fit in. She changed her name and much about herself. Later, though, she experienced depression and eating disorder and all sorts of existential problems. She pursued Hollywood fame, men, and the American dream, but always fell short until she stopped. With the help of the Tao Te Ching, she rediscovered herself and her innate power, and she learned to chill. Her new book, Don't Just Sit There, Do Nothing, will help others do the same. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for everybody who has supported the podcast. So there's so many ways you can support the podcast and the work that I'm doing. One, you can spread the word about the podcast. So share the podcast with someone you know, repost my anything on social media. If you are a therapist listening to the podcast and you have a client who you think would benefit, share it with them. This podcast has grown completely organically. It is all because of you all sharing the podcast. And we are coming up on a million downloads, which is amazing. Other ways that you can support the podcast is through Patreon. So if you would like to become a patron, you can go to Patreon, put in Dr. Amy Robbins. You can find different tiers to support the podcast at the five, 10 or $20 level or any other denomination. And my $20 supporters do get once quarterly Zoom calls with me. They've been fabulous. For a while, I was doing them for all the supporters, but now I am closing that down to just the $20 a month supporters. I really want to honor those who are really committed to supporting the podcast. And I'm so grateful. If you benefit from the podcast, if your life has shifted or changed as a result of the podcast, please help me continue to help you have on these great guests. Also follow me on Instagram, Dr. Amy Robbins. I love hearing from my listeners, trying to do my best to be quick to respond. And lastly, rate, review, and subscribe. That is super important. I also love reading the reviews. So you can rate the podcast, but you can also review the podcast. Thank you all for all of your support, for all of your love, for all of your helping to collectively raise the consciousness of this planet. I am so incredibly grateful. So tell us a bit about your story, which seems so appropriate given kind of where we are now in in the world, you know, this refugee story. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, it is interesting to me because I um, I think we must have a similar understanding of the world uh, because of the spirituality aspect uh, that we share. And so I don't really believe in coincidences. I believe in synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Uh, And my book, Don't Just Sit There, Do Nothing, Healing, Chilling, and Living with the Tao Te Ching, it came out four days after the war in Ukraine began. Wow. And I do have a chapter in the book. I believe it's chapter 16. Yes, it's chapter 16 where I write about my experience of um, filming a movie with Vladimir Zelensky, Mm -hmm. because in my, one of my many past lives, I should say, I was, um, I was a struggling actress. And so I just thought, um, we mean past life, current life. No, no, no. Yes. I'm sorry. I mean, many past lives in my current physical. I just mean uh, past (laughs) past endeavors. Let's call it. That's right. Perfect. Perfect. (laughs) I should correct myself in our in, in the realm that we're talking. My and audience I, would be like, wait, which past life is she talking? <laughs> well, I'm only talking about this current life, but one of my past endeavors, let's just Perfect. say. I Perfect. think that even in our singular physical life that we're in now, we still live as many different people. If if we're if we're exploring and uh taking chances, sometimes we find ourselves in completely different situations. A thousand percent. That's a great way of putting it. 
And so um, all of this, um, you know, with the book coming out, it was hard for me as a former Soviet refugee, my father being from Ukraine, I was born in Latvia and um, it was definitely an interesting experience of launching this book when, you know, it felt like the world was falling apart. Uh, obviously, as we know now, it's a long process and I still believe uh, the the goodness will triumph. <laughs> but uh, the the interesting parallels between my own story and what we're seeing right now, it just keeps leading me back to the same thing, that the, the Tao Te Ching, this ancient philosophy from 6th century BC, it tells the truth. You know, it tells the truth of the way things can be better for us. Now, even though there's only one truth, in my opinion, there's diff many different ways of telling it. And so the Tao tells it in a way that I find very accessible, which is why I sort of base my book around it. But this truth can be told in many versions and many different words. The Tao is something that really reflected the ease that I want to see in my own life. And that's why I was so drawn to it. I did, you know, I a lot of my looking for ease and looking for truth came from my loss of identity as a as a refugee child. And that happened when I was eight years old. Uh, we sought asylum in America. It wasn't a simple situation because we had to live in other countries while awaiting asylum. And living as a refugee in other countries is complicated and it's especially confusing to a kid. And although, of course, now it's very clear why my parents might want to leave the Russian, then Soviet uh, government and they really did. My family suffered under that government for many, many years. Uh, my grandparents survived the Holocaust, but they were also sent to Stalin camps. And my mom was born in the shadow of the Siberian gulags in Siberia. And so I understand that now. But as a child, all you know is your home, your stability. And then when that's all gone, you sort of have to reinvent yourself, which is what I did in America. And so my birth name, for example, was Asia, but nobody here could pronounce it. I changed it to Jesse. And I really wasn't accepted because this was on the heels of the Cold War when I came. Mm -hmm. And so I just got branded as Russian, even though I'm really not. I'm actually the Soviet Jew that has um, roots in both Ukraine and Latvia. Um, but I spoke Russian and to find myself, I had to actually create her, create the person that got accepted, create the person that was cool, create the person that had friends. And because I'm a survivalist, I'm good at that. I'm very malleable. Um, and it's also something I think a lot of empaths have the ability to do. Yes, we feel a lot of pain, but we can also adjust ourselves. And that's what I did. But all of that caught up with me. Mm -hmm. All of these changes and this un resolve childhood trauma because no one had the time to discuss anything you know it was it was building a life that needed to happen and food and shelter and the basics and so as a teenager I ended up with an eating disorder I later ended up with anxiety and panic attacks and when I graduated college I was just a real mess but on the outside you'd never be able to tell because I was a straight-a student and I dressed the part and I looked good and I, you know, I presented myself. I knew how to put on those masks. Uh, but inside, I was still struggling with bulimia and those panic attacks. And then I got into a major car crash right after college. And so then stillness was really forced upon me mm. because I was physically broken and I was still emotionally struggling. And that's back then is when I began working with different spiritual modalities I studied Reiki. I did a lot of things that helped me and that I still use to this day. A lot of uh, spiritual and ancient philosophy that I use to this day to bring myself back to center because it's not like you're healed and better forevermore. You know, life is right. Like it works in waves. But that's when I first started reading. This is my old tattered copy of the Tao Te Ching. And then I started collecting more and more copies. And so Eventually, I began writing my story, my own life story, my own struggles and triumphs through the lens of the Tao and what I learned in living the Tao. And that's what this book is.
So can you explain what the ancient text is of the Tao? Like when sure. was it written? You said sixth century, who yep. wrote it? Sure. What are some of the lessons that it um, imparts to us? Yes, it was written in sixth century BC China. Uh, the actual author is not really historically known. They say that Lao Tzu wrote it. Now Lao Tzu translates as the old guy or the wise guy, de depending on which translation you look at. So some uh, historians believe it's sort of like a Homer kind of character where, you know, none of us know in any of the old religions or philosophies, we don't really know, was it one person? Was it an amalgam of people? But this information came through, however it came through. And it's, the Tao is very, very simple. It is 81 verses, 81 little poems that speak about life and about the way to live with the flow, go with the flow of life. And I, I like to call it the, the world's oldest self-help book because it is not a religion in itself. There is the religion of Taoism. Um, it has a lot of other texts and a lot of, you know, in that religion, for example, Lao Tzu is seen as a deity. I look at it as a lot of people look at it as a philosophy for myself, mm -hmm. um, as a simple philosophical text. And it basically teaches three tenets, although there's, of course, many more, um, many more idiosyncrasies or, or smaller lessons. But right, I, I think, yes, yes, I like to. And, the, and then, the, you know, sometimes even the translations, because in order to write my book that is based in the Tao, like I had to go through so many different translations that I understood sometimes translations differ as well. And so what I did is collect various translations and put them into my book. So I also didn't include all the verses. Some of them are a bit repetitive. And I chose my favorite verses that really worked well in my life uh, so that I could leave people in the end of each chapter. I have a do your doubt section, which leaves folks with a takeaway or a series of takeaways. I call them shifts that can perhaps follow you way past reading just that you can practice in your life and so the three tenets of the Tao Te Ching which translates as the book of the way mm. uh, the three tenets are simplicity patience compassion uh, and I couldn't think of what anything that we need more of in our modern world than simplicity patience compassion uh, we now consume more information in a single day than just a few hundred years ago people did in their whole lifetime. Yeah, that makes sense. Right, which is why we're so overwhelmed and tired a lot of the time. And, uh, and we consume it so quickly without yes. really one choosing it, right? Because right, a lot it, of it chooses right. us. Uh, right. And two, really thinking about it. Like I think about, I know you, I had read a little bit about you that even being Jewish, you weren't raised necessarily with religion because under the yeah. Soviet regime, you couldn't truly practice religion. Um, yeah, but my I parents think, are atheists, yeah. But I think about back even to the days, and even now when I worked in an, in an Orthodox community, you know, they spend time debating back and forth these ancient texts and what they mean and what, how they were yeah. intended. And there's these really rich discussions around it. Yeah, and I, I had done that a bit. I went to um, New York University and I studied a bit with a rabbi there as well. Um, uh, I love dissecting things when we take them non-literally, which is why I always call myself spiritual, not religious. It, it doesn't mean that I don't see the beauty of Judaism and even the beauty of, uh, though I obviously I was not raised it, but even the beauty of the teachings of Jesus. Like I like to look at the beauty behind the stuff that sometimes humans put on these teachings that made them maybe not as pure as they were initially. That's my opinion, you know, mm -hmm. but I loved studying with an Orthodox rabbi to understand the Torah in a, in a way that, you know, because later I did, you know, and my parents, Again, they're definitely secular, but they do have an understanding of God and of spirituality now after being in America for uh, over 30 years. This was not this was something very much missing from the Soviet Union. And I dare say really missing from 
from the Russian Federation now, as we see that, you know, it doesn't matter what they practice, the soul of mm. humanity, the soul of what spirituality is, is missing from that nation. I'm not going to talk about individual people. I know that there's good people everywhere, but that's what we're seeing right now. What happens when we lose connection with the deeper human connection to God, the human connection to our higher selves. And you don't have to even bring God into it if you don't want to, to the universe, to source energy. When we completely sever that connection and we live in separateness, bad things happen is the truth. And it's Mm -hmm. the same on an individual level. We live better when we constantly cultivate our connection to something higher than our physical reality. So let's talk about some of these tenants and how people can integrate them into our lives sure. in, in a way, because to your point, like we are, everybody is so crazed. I almost feel like now perhaps even more. I mean, I think we were pr- in pretty bad shape before 20 March of 2020. I almost think, I mean, I think that the, the, energy now is even worse. I agree Um, with you. Kind of coming out of it and the way in which people have gone back into a real frenetic lifestyle. So how does the Tao talk about simplicity? The Tao talks all the time about, you know, what difference between yes and no, what difference between success and failure, simplify what you have, simplify what you want. And there's all of these um, also almost Buddhist like ideas as well about non-attachment to desire. And I struggle with these a lot. And that's why I write about it. And don't just sit there, do nothing. My book is divided into three sections, identity, awareness, creation, identity because it's such a part of my life figuring out who I was who I am awareness because I say self-awareness is a superpower Mm -hmm. Uh, once you understand self-awareness and awareness of what's going on around you and then creation so that you can create from this place of depth versus oh I want you know a new this or a new that or whatever simplify what you have simplify what you want is something that I work with within myself a lot because I actually have adult ADHD, really. (laughs) Um, um, My friends joke around, you know, like uh, one of my friends called me recently (laughs) (laughs) sidetrack. And I think it describes a lot of us, to be honest with you, right? A lot of us chatty women and men as well. (laughs) Yeah. And, And I also, I just listened to this podcast about how we've been basically robbed of our attention um, sure. because of, of all the social media and everything, what, sure. how that has hijacked our ability to attend to one thing yep. at a time. Yep. I'm super guilty of it too. We've all found ourselves on our phone. It's too late. We're scrolling. We're look, checking Twitter. We're checking the news. We're trying to send an email. We're trying to listen to a podcast and we get nothing done. And right. then, and then we will wake up exhausted. And so One of the things is obviously what we're talking about right now is simplifying the tasks in front of us. And that doesn't mean not letting yourself be frantic. It's setting time limits on it. You know, I'm logging on to Instagram because often like I log on to get someone's information, for example, and 10 minutes later, I forget why I'm there. Mm -hmm. And that is not my fault or your fault or anyone else's fault. That that's an algorithm that works to do that to us. And we're not as strong and uh, as we think we are. So it's that's why I say the, this awareness is a superpower. It's at least know when you're allowing yourself to exist in a state of entropy, at least accept it. At least know that you're choosing that mm-hmm. so that you can choose different when you're ready. Mm-hmm. And so to me, simplicity, uh, writing is a great way for me to connect to my state of flow where I am actually focused because I'm just one with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Meditation is a great way for that. Sometimes just to walk in nature without your phone is just really, really nice to take yourself out of your madness, to simplify everything. Like seriously, breathe, hold at the top, breathe out, hold at the bottom. There's a beautiful balance that we can come to with our desires 
in simplifying our desires, because this is the, something the Tao tells us a lot about, simplify your desires. And you're like, but how? I want this. I'm working toward this. I'm supposed to have goals. So to me, the simplifying comes from the second part, which is patience and understanding that my timeline and the universe's timeline may not look the same. Mm -hmm. And so it allows me to have more ease in my journey. It's an, the understanding that there's no end goal that we reach and then we're done. That the entire process of creation as a journey, the process of working towards our desires or manifestation as people call it now. In my book, I call it manifestation. The entire process. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm a spiritual dork. That's why I've made it a little play on words, but the entire process is a journey. And when you take the time limits that we set on ourselves out of it, Mm. And you can understand that you can have many things in life, just not at the same time. Like, for example, I have young kids now. Is It's not the worst thing in the world that my career isn't yet at a point that I one day imagine it to be at. You know, it's, it's okay. And it's maybe for the best for myself right now. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's practicing this patience that also has become super difficult to do because we live in an instant gratification world. Right, right. And, and I can so appreciate where you, what you're speaking to, oftentimes, even with my own patients, um, they'll say things to me because with my podcast, I've become more public and they'll, they'll kind of allude to, well, you, you do so much. Yeah. And I'll say, well, but my kids are not young. I mean, I don't have little, little kids anymore. They're older. So for, yeah, for up until maybe three years ago, I worked, or up until I started this podcast, I worked my clinical job and, and I was with my kids and I did that part-time because my goal, my work at that point was raising my, helping to raise my kids. Now that they're a little, they're not old, but they're a little older, they're more self-sufficient. Yeah. So those, those priorities can shift. Now, would I have liked to have been moving along throughout that? Of course I would have, but I couldn't, to your point of simplicity, yes. what would have me doing all of that have looked like? Because it wouldn't have been a great version of me. That's right. And it's something that I think a lot of us women have to understand and it's hard to do. And, and I say women, it should really be men as well, but there's still a lot more of mothering, of parenting that falls on women if, mm -hmm. if we're realistic. But honestly, it could be anyone that wants, if you, if you envision a certain kind of connection with your children, with your family, then everything in life is a balance. And one thing is at the cost of something else. And that and balance is also something the Tao speaks a lot of. This is that simplicity. Of, it's the same thing with me. I started writing really fully writing when my younger daughter was one. But what did this writing look like? This writing looked like me writing at night and it was a slower process. And yeah, probably, you know, eventually I was published in like New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera. I probably, if you asked me then, would have wanted that immediately, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would have published a book immediately. But I think that it's better that things take time. I think that it's in our own best interest, but we don't realize that because our human, almost childlike self wants what we want immediately. Mm-hmm. And so the patience, all of these tenants work together. So this patience part works with the simplicity part and it helps practice non-attachment because also you live long enough, you start to see that sometimes what you want doesn't happen, but something even better, something different does. Practicing a sort of faith that if something feels like it is not working, that it's okay to let it go or to take a turn in it in a different direction, instead of continuously pushing these boulders up the hill, it's re learning to read the signs of life as well so that we can change our course based on kind of what life is telling us, what life is giving us. So we work with life instead of against it. The Tao talks a lot about that, about going with the flow of things rather than against. It says that there's this nice line that I like that the Tao is simple and the Tao remembers the way because the Tao, they change the book of the way. So the Tao is simple, but people prefer the side paths. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think it's a, it is our human nature sometimes to complicate things where they need not be complicated. Mm-hmm. 
Hi, everybody. I have a new offering that a few of you have taken advantage of so far, and it is a spiritual consultation. So, so many of you had reached out to me with like questions or wanting to know how to open up more, wanting to know, you know, what you should do in this area of your life or that area of your life that I thought I would just try to offer a new way to connect with me. So these are spiritual consultations. They can be 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half. And in that time, we talk about kind of what questions you have, whether it's about opening up more spiritually, whether it's about something in your life. And we really kind of come to an understanding and a conclusion about what the next steps you need to take to achieve that are. Again, this is new to me. I've done a few of them. They are phenomenal. I am so enjoying them. It is not a therapy session. Be clear. It is not a therapy session. It is not a medium reading. It is somewhere in between. So it is using, we, we incorporate meditation and intuition and um, manifestation and intention and all of this in like a very brief period of time, but it has been extremely powerful. And the people that I, I believe that have done it have walked away feeling like they really had something tangible that they could carry with them and um, help them move their life forward. So if this is something you're interested in, please reach out to me. I don't have a lot of um, spots for them. So I'm only doing maybe one or two a month, but um, really keeping a wait list for those who are interested. So you can find that on my website if you want to dramyrobbins.com and you can go on there and click on spiritual consultation and I will get you scheduled. It might be a month or two out, but I am, I'm trying to get everybody who's interested in. So go ahead and check that out. If you have any questions, just email me about it through the website as well. So how does creativity get woven into this? Because you weave creativity into the Tao. Yes. And um, I just real quick want to say the, the third part, compassion, because I oh. forgot to like the mm-hmm. compassion part. It says the Tao says starting with compassion towards yourself, I which I say, love. Yeah, it has to yeah, be towards which I love first. It's so, it starts with yourself, which, by the way, is so easy to extend compassion to others once you give it to yourself. And I know that because I've been a person who was so hard on herself, I wouldn't let myself, you know, eat food normally. And to a person now who forgives, I forgive myself for everything, even imperfect mothering, which I think we have such a hard time with as moms. Mm-hmm. And so for the self-forgiveness then extends to all of your relationships, which is a beautiful thing. Cause then when you're accepting of yourself and you can accept others in their imperfect forms, there's a lot more ease in your life. You don't hold on to these grudges and resentments. Now to your point of uh, creativity. So I think creativity gets a certain kind of description in our human mind where, you know, we think of creativity as writing or painting or dancing or whatnot. And, you know, I I just want to point out, and I know that you know that, but I just want to point out that creativity is everything. Mm -hmm. I believe that all of life is like your, you know, beautiful painting and everything you do is creative. I, I think parenting is an extremely creative endeavor and <laughs> right. Yes, it is. <laughs> right. And I've seen um, people, uh, entrepreneurial people who I realized are really creative with their solutions. So, so I just want to take off the um, blocks on creativity that I think sometimes put it in a certain kind of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, package. Uh, but again, like if you're able to go with the flow a little more, your creativity very naturally flows from you because rigidity is the opposite of creativity. Mm -hmm. You know, when you decide ahead of time that things are going to look like A, B, and C, and you're first, you're going to do this, and then you're going to do that. And that, you know, that you're kind of limiting the creative flow of things. And then the other thing I want to add, since my book is called, don't just sit there, do nothing. When you don't give yourself breaks, you also limit your creativity. And it is often the way the brain works, and this is not just, uh, you know, my idea, there's studies on this, uh, you know, I've heard psychologists talk about the brain needing breaks to come up with solutions. Mm-hmm. So this is why meditation can work so beautifully when you sit down to meditate with a certain problem or conundrum. Sometimes the space of not thinking about it, you're not going there to think about it for the next 15 minutes. Let's say you're meditating, you just 
sit down and you're like, I have this. And you kind of set it down for a right. little bit, giving ourselves space from the constant working and the constant churning of that wheel and the back-to-back plans is a very important for creativity to find its space. Well, I mean, we suffocate ourselves in so many ways with everything that there, that there isn't time. And when, you know, we're talking a little bit about parenting here, but when we think about kids and allowing them the space to play, and this is a concept in psychotherapy as well is this concept of play that when we allow them that people, kids, whomever, open space to kind of play what they create is, is typically miraculous. But when we don't give it space, there's no place to do that. There's no place to create. Sometimes we do need to set parameters for ourselves just to give ourselves the space. And that may look like blocking time off on our calendar because we've gotten so busy and we've gotten so overwhelmed. We need to schedule time for ourselves for that play. What does do nothing mean? So, and do we know how to do that? Like is meditating (laughs) doing nothing or is just sitting there doing nothing or is reading a book doing nothing or are those all something? Those are all something and are all nothing. So the the joke here (laughs) is that the Tao Te Ching, it's full of paradoxes. Um, I think that the second verse, which I write about um, in my second chapter, some of it line up, um, being and non-being create each other. Difficult and easy support each other. Long and short define each other. High and low depend on each other before and after follow each other. So it's this, it's this understanding that everything in life, in, in this world, in this physical world, is a, there's a duality, right? So the Tao talks a lot about, for example, we live in a house, we build a house to, to live in, but it's the space within the house that allows us to have the room to live. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's not the walls that we build, it's the space within. So Mm -hmm. in reality, and you know this, there is no doing nothing in our lives because we are in a constant state of motion anyway. I mean, science has shown us as much that we're actually mostly space and mostly vibrating energy. That's what Mm -hmm. we're mostly, we're mostly moving all the time anyway and changing constantly. So there isn't, actually a doing nothing because that's right. Meditating is doing something and taking a walk is doing something and reading is doing something. So for me, this idea of doing nothing is not doing anything quote unquote practical. Mm. We don't give ourselves the time to not doing something that is on your task list that you need to do for work, that you need to do for your family, that it's, it's allowing yourself this play that you were talking about. Mm-hmm. allowing yourself a rest from the very nature of human reality where we have to do this and we have to do that and we and getting a break from that because there is more to us but how are we going to ever connect to our inner voice and to our inner wisdom and to that something more that exists if we don't give ourselves the space to do nothing which of course is not actually nothing <laughs> Right. And I also think about how do we connect to each other if we're not doing, right. so, if we're doing something right. Like it, I think we so often, I, I, I try to make a real point to walk with friends, um, to take walks with my friend, my girlfriends, because I think it's an opportunity to connect, but I think there are people that would feel like that's not productive. I'm not doing anything, but that to me, in some ways, even though I'm walking feels like doing nothing because there's no, there's no end goal. There's no yeah. like check it off the list. It just feels like, it feels like me time. Like that's the time I need to connect. I need that for my soul. I need those connections for my soul. So, I also love w- walking dates. I love those as well. Yeah. And sometimes with my husband as well, you know, we go on bike rides sometimes without kids, just us. And it's really nice. I think people have this idea of date night, for example, mm-hmm. in my community. There's, a, But I find it much better for that soul part of me and then us as a relationship because it's a it's its own entity to get out in nature by ourselves. Sometimes mm-hmm. I find it 
And I also find it wonderful with the kids as well to go on a hike and to do these nature walks. I do think that getting outside and walking with somebody is wonderful. But I also, to that point, it is vital to spend time alone too. Mm-hmm. And some people fear that, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's harder. You know, yes and no, because so for me, I feel that I've done it for so much of my life. I need it. I really mm-hmm. need it. But then I realized that I think everyone needs it. Mm-hmm. Before the pandemic, when I used to go to a lot of like yoga classes and there's always a lot of people that wouldn't stay at the end for the shavasana, oh, for the yes. breath work. Uh, I have friends that tell me like they just hate that part so much. And that was always puzzling to me. But I understand that if you never give yourself that time, a sudden influx of time to just be with yourself can be frightening. But I really encourage people to get past that block because it becomes so nurturing once we get past the block of being afraid to be with ourselves. It's really nurturing. Mm -hmm. It's healing. Well, and it sounds like each step that you describe really opens you up bit by bit to being more whole. Yes. And also I now know to say this when, you know, when I speak to, as I said, to businesses, I I say that it also is, it makes you more productive because people want, people want to be productive, right? (laughs) That's why they don't want to stop. So now that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Like you said, I am a fiend for wholeness. I'm a spiritual searcher for life. Like this is to me, there's nothing more like nothing lights me up more than a deeper and a deeper connection with, with my own inner power, which is actually like a, eternal power, which is everyone's power. Right. I right. always say that the magic that I found within myself is unbelievably incredible and also completely mundane because it's in me and it's in everyone. Right. So, and it's accessible to everybody. It's yes. not unique or special for you. Exactly. And then, right. but it is really special, but it is really special, you know? Right. But yeah, it's like, it, it, it's amazing. Yeah. And everybody can have that. That's right. That's that duality that the Tao speaks of. I understood finally, because it talks a lot about humility too. Mm-hmm. Humility is natural when you understand that I am God, but so is everyone else, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And how does and, that change your relationships with others? Sure. I am it, God it, and so is everybody else. It changes your relationship because A, you take nothing personally. So when somebody does something that doesn't feel nice to you, I was the most sensitive child, the most sensitive person for a very long time. I still am sensitive, but it doesn't hurt me anymore, my sensitivity, because of this greater understanding that I have. So if somebody does something that is unpleasant to me, I'm able to let it go really quickly these days. And that doesn't mean I don't voice it. It doesn't mean that I allow myself to be a doormat. It means that I don't carry shit with me. Well, and that I think is compassion, right? It's, Where you you're can, right. That's the compassion part. You're right. That's the compassion part towards yourself and then towards other people. Mm-hmm. But you know what else I've noticed? I'm also able to see more clearly when maybe I did something imperfect. When maybe I did something that possibly was unpleasant to somebody else. I see that. I never used to own up to that kind of stuff because I, I'm such a good person. I would never consciously do something bad to another. And, and there was this like kind of block. And now I have such a clear understanding that the imperfections that we do and that are done to us as humans are just part of this human self of ours. Mm-hmm. And there's a greater us and there's a greater you and a greater me if the, your lesser you did something unpleasant to me, it's not about me. It's about whatever blocks, whatever Mm -hmm. things you have to work out in your personhood. And why would it bother me Mm -hmm. other than however it inconvenienced me, whatever, why would it bother me? It's not for me to carry. And when somebody tells me something that maybe that I did, I'm able to look at it now. And when I'm able to look at stuff um, with that full self-awareness that I spoke about, I can even see the traces of, I actually understand where that came from, what insecurity of my own that came from. Right, right. But when you're, when you look, 
Yeah, and when you look at, at it with compassion, you're not judging yourself for, uh, in that moment. You're not saying like, well, I couldn't have done that because I'm so good. You're not judging. You're just looking. And so then you're able to do that for others. Mm-hmm. So like you said, the compassion part. So can we do a quick speed round? Oh, sure. I would question. love to. Okay. I would love to. Like that's something a therapist would know to do because I, then I don't have time to filter my thoughts, right? Right. The speed round. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I just want to hear yeah. like people's true, like authentic. Yeah. 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 And I actually did, did get the idea from um, a colleague of mine who has a podcast called the healing catalyst and she does really quick speed rounds. So I love it. Avanti, Dr. Avanti. Dr. Avanti. Um, okay. Spirituality means a connection with the higher self, or you could call it source energy or God, that connection with something that is bigger than your physical self. What is something most people don't know about you? I love sleep. And there are plenty of days when I put my kids on the bus at 745 and get back into bed. Oh my God. (laughs) Today would have been one of those days for me. That sounds amazing. What is one thing you are really looking forward to right now? I love, uh, the blooming of spring into summer, that season when you're just able to walk outside without any extra clothing and get on a bike or go on a walk or do whatever, just breathe the air in. What is one thing you're deeply grateful for? My children. What book is on your nightstand right now? Uh, don't just sit there, do nothing. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, I'm kidding. Yes, there is my own book on my night stand, but also I love uh, Paul Selig. Oh, so I just, I literally just finished um, The Kingdom. The Kingdom. Thank you. I, I was like, not the knowing, him. The Kingdom. Did just you just interview him? Yeah, a couple uh, weeks ago. Yeah, I, I love Paul Selig. And so Laura Day uh, is the intuitive who wrote my foreword for my book, and she's a longtime intuitive. and. Uh, Paul Selig and her are best friends. And so that was my entry point into his work. Just amazing. Yeah, his his channeling is pretty profound. It is pretty profound. And I found, you know, how I knew that I was on the right track. It was after I finished the Dao, my book, Don't Just Sit There, Do Nothing. But I, I knew that the Tao was a good teaching, a honest, truthful teaching is because the guides, a lot of the things they would say are things that I wrote about based on this ancient teaching because the truth is one and the guides would say the truth is one. <laughs> right. Right. And he says he channels Christ consciousness. Right. Like that's, exactly. that's right. sort of his, but I think to your point, all of these teachings, when you really look at them, if they're pure, say the same thing. That's right. But because we are, there's, we're such a variety of personalities we each may need different modalities to hear mm-hmm. this truth. Mm-hmm. Maybe something that speaks to me is not necessarily what speaks to you. And that's okay. And that's why there's never too many of us telling, speaking this truth and getting to the bottom of this truth. It's important work that we do. I've realized that through Paul Selig's books. Mm-hmm. He's got new ones coming out too. So I'm I know have I'm back excited to, to talk about those. What is your favorite spiritual or healing practice? I love to simplify, as we talked about (laughs) simplicity, to simplify everything. So I do a very simplified version of energy healing, and it's just the laying of hands. I love to do it um, to my pets, to my kids, just the laying of hands. And my kids are so used to this that they don't think it's a weird thing that I do. But if they're going to sleep and they're extra chatty and I just put my hand on their foreheads or on their, you know, on the crown chakra part of their heads. And I just send good energy through my hands. It's just the laying of hands. Very simple. What is the most transformative experience in your life? I, um, for my 40th birthday, because I had never done this, I did a shroom experience with my husband, Mm -hmm. a psychedelic mushroom experience. And it's not something I would do frequently because that's not Oh, it doesn't fit with my life. Let's just say, right, right. But, but it was very, as a spiritual experience, how I wanted it to be. And that is what it was for me. And it, mm. all of the teachings that I've been focusing my life on just felt so real for me. I felt the oneness of everything. Mm. That's cool. What a cool birthday gift to give yourself. 
That's right. <laughs> that was like that's what I wanted. Because right. <laughs> because I am always searching for spiritual growth. And it was just this moment that I wanted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for your time today. If people want to learn more about you, learn about your book, where can they find you? You're a lot of places because I was on your website today. Yeah. Because <laughs> usually I read the books before. My listeners yeah. all know that I did not get a book before, which is why I didn't read it, which is why you're not hearing me saying like, go get this book. It's amazing. I can't, I don't know, but it sounds like it would be, but I don't want my listeners to think that I'm not promoting it because I didn't. Right. Because I didn't like yeah. it. I just didn't read it. So that's and that is my- and that is probably an oversight of some part of my teams, let's be honest, but or whatever it is. It doesn't um, matter. But I just want you people know, to it sounds like it would be great. And when I was reading, I did read the yeah. first chapter online because it's free online. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I really wish I would have gotten this one. Well, I think we can manage that, Amy. I really think we can. And had I not procrastinated, I would have realized before today, (laughs) or I would have realized earlier this weekend, probably when I would have gone to have read it, that it it wasn't there. But well, we could, like I said, we could take care of that. But yeah, don't just sit there, do nothing is available wherever books are sold, like Amazon, but also indie bookstores or bookshop. jessiecanzer.com is my website, J-E-S-S-I-E-K-A-N-Z-E-R.com, just for those who are driving. <laughs> right, and, right. And it will be on my show notes yeah, and everything. Yeah. So. As Amy said, there's also uh, free chapters to start you off on. And there's actually bonus material for those who enjoy the book. Uh, plus, I am almost daily, I'm on Instagram at, at jessiecanzer. And I'll have all of that in the show notes. So Jesse, thank you so much for your time today. I think it was fantastic. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Wondering what comes next and what it all means? Head over to Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between.